Hey guys, good evening. We're going to give people a few minutes to get here. Hope you all have had a good week. Can y'all hear me okay? All right. Just another minute or two and then we'll get started. Hey, Nathaniel, good deal. Hey, Sean, good to see you. All right, we're starting to get a few people coming in. Uh, tell your friends that we're getting this thing going right now if you want to. Um, all right, before we get started, I've got a couple things I need to do, and then we'll get going. First off, if you're so inclined, if I can get this open, feel free to join me in a drink tonight. We're having Seagram 7 and Dr. Pepper. Let me see here. Yeah, just a wee dram more. Mm, why not? It's Thursday. We can have a drink. All right, let me set this out of the way. And to those that are watching, I'm uh, hoping that uh, those of you that were able to join me Sunday night for uh, the Ogham readings, um, that was really fun. It was good to get together with people and just, you know, kind of give you guys a preview about what tonight was going to be about. And um, let me get this closed. All right, before we drink that. All right, what I want to do is... Uh, you know, considering the situation with everything, I think it's a good idea before every time that we get together and before every class that we just take a little bit of time and get the energy set for uh, everything. So just close your eyes with me and breathe deep. And as you exhale, we're going to chant the all in three times. Um. May the blessings of mind, body, and spirit be yours. All right. It's been a long week. Some crazy things have been going on. But it's always good to be able to take time out and get together. And, uh, you know, have a little bit of time together to learn things. Um, now tonight, I'm going to say that, uh, just at the beginning of everything, that uh, the stuff that we talk about in the classes is not, we're not going super deep. Um, we will get into deeper topics later on and deeper things, but basically what these are are for people that are in the beginnings of figuring out what they want to do in uh, pantheistic druidry, Irish druidry, uh, and different things. So, being that said, this is just a scratching of the surface. Um, also, tonight, with the way everything is, uh, talking about Ogham and druid magic, 
my Gaelic is horrible. So uh, just bear with me because my pronunciations and enunciations of various things are not going to be the best, but I'll do what I can. And um, all right. And we've got a good group of people here. We've got 51 people. Wow. I'm so glad that you guys are here. If you guys are uh, having trouble hearing, let me know. I can try to adjust stuff, but I think everything's okay. Um, you know, we, we've gone, this is fourth, this is the fourth class. This is a, uh, a, a topic that a lot of people ask, okay, well, you know, you, they figured out who the Druids are. They figured out a little bit about the gods and thanks for the thumbs up guys. Um, and they, and you know, they've learned about, uh, you know, the ideas of, uh, some of the spiritual concepts like we talked about last week with uh, uh, the you know the other world and Awen and things like that which we're going to go deeper into that later on down the line but uh, oh yeah well it's like it's a hard language uh, you know all forms of Gaelic are a hard language to come you know come across and to pronounce correctly so sometimes it's just like you do the best you can and you hit it uh, you know, as, as much as you can. Uh, I love the language, but I don't think I'll ever be perfect unless I ever get a chance to go to Ireland, which after all this is over with, I would love to, but right now I'm just going to have to suffice it to stay where I'm at. Um, so the next thing that people ask about uh, a lot of times is the idea of, okay, so we've got the spiritual concepts out of the way. We've got some uh, base knowledge of what the gods are. We've got a little bit about an idea of what the druids and the and uh, their their designations, you know, Bardo, Vate, and Seer. But the next thing that we want to get into, because pagans get not just pushy, but they get impatient, so they start to go, well, what about the magical side of things? Okay, well, that's what we're going to dis discuss tonight. And believe it or not, to me, looking, okay, comparing uh, comparatively uh, uh, Druidic and, and Irish uh, thoughts and, and processes when it comes to magical working and thinking are on par with, to me, with a lot of the Western esoteric traditions um, and can go beyond even some of the more classic uh, you know, pantheistic traditions, uh, to me, a little bit beyond as a true, a little bit beyond uh, Hellen Hellenism, and some of these other things, because there's depth in certain ritual processes and things that you don't necessarily see in other other traditions. The one thing that I will say, because of the fact that we're all here on this one planet, is that there are a lot more similarities than that then we realize that you just have to know how to uh to look into you know to look at those um and the the two things that are the most uh um uh studied at the beginning are the idea of various parts of juridical magic work and then on the other side is the idea of um working with the ogum now the Ogham is the now the one thing is there's there's everybody says what it is and what it isn't. We're going to talk about the history of the Ogham here in just a minute. But the thing about that is, is when you look at the Ogham as uh, the way that we see it now, um, and a lot of scholars have put out whether it's uh, graves or uh, the you know some of the other things, we are you know it, whenever it comes down to it, we are basically uh, reconstructing what, like I've said before, we are reconstructing what we think has gone on because you have so many people on the other side, the historical side of things that have said, well, you know, this, you know, that there hasn't been anything that says that uh, uh, itself has been used for anything more than uh, a, a early form of, of type of like a, uh, linguistics and writing for uh, the Celts and the Irish and things like that, and that as far as the idea of um, uh, meditation and working with uh, the the uh, the Ogham itself, that that's a modern invention. It depends on how far back you want to say modern is, and it depends on 
where you're seeing it, it being invented, and we're going to get into that in just a minute. Um, but the main thing is that, that we can say, because there is actual evidence of this, that specifically in Ireland and other places, that the ovum itself has been used as a, a kind of like um, delineators of, of counties, of areas of tribes, of farms, of fields, and what you'll see is ovum posts uh, in various places that are of various ages that uh, have ogham inscri inscribed on them that a lot of people are saying like, well, this belongs to here and this belongs to there. And because of the fact that we can see, you know, standing representations of these ogham still, that that that's a you know that can be a given that these may very well be seventy percent chance that they are um, you know delineators of space, but I'm one of those people that believes that the Celts and specifically the Irish Celts uh, were ones that did use uh, at some point or another maybe not as much as we would like to think that they have but have used the ogham uh, in uh, ritual and and various things before because like I say we aren't there we weren't there we are going by what uh, evidence that we can seek out through various uh, authors and things that have come up to over the years and like I said in various classes a lot of the information that we have received isn't from Celtic scholars specifically a lot of it is what we're getting from observational uh, writings from people that were Greek and from other uh, cultures that had supposedly witnessed you know these different things so um, it you know as far as the historical validity of various things that's up to interpretation but on the other side of it I believe as pagans that it is up to us to um, turn those conventions on their head okay so we don't know um, you know what necessarily that was all about. As an example, if you look at the picture that I've used for uh, this, or this week's class, you'll see a person standing in a grove of trees with a big tree right in front of them, and down in the middle you see something called Finn's Window. And a lot of uh, uh, people uh, kind of, um, how would I think it? It's like it's like they have used it as a mandala, um, used it for meditational and trance work, and things like that. So there is possibilities, and the idea of of working with ogham beyond a linguistic uh, uh, staple is something that I tend to believe in because of the fact that there are so many other uh, magical and ritual uh, writing forms that I do believe kind of in their own right have some kind of a validity and be power in themselves now the, the idea of the power in themselves is, is this whenever you write something you have an intention and then you take it and you put it to the pen and then you put it on the page now from your head to the page there's an intent that goes down to your hand and gets written so once you place a magical glyph or whatever on paper or whatever medium that you're putting it on you are giving that writing glyph whatever you're giving it its own um, you're giving it its own power and its own validity also the idea that others have done it over the centuries and and so on and so forth and many many years it comes with its own inherent power because of the people that have worked with it in the past so when somebody says that the ogams are the OM are simply a linguistic standard. Yes, there's validity for some of that, but I also believe that it is highly magical. And uh, also there are ties to um, uh, the trees and things like that. And we're going to deal with the trees and druids and the trees in general in another class, but something I need to bring up here. Um, uh, the Ogham script was uh, found and recorded in the earliest Old Irish text dating between the 3rd and the 6th century CE. Um, basically, 
in Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. I've got some notes I've gotten here. Um, they are genealogical inscriptions um, in the form of X equals son of Y and uh, are, were, you know, corners of large stone slabs. After the 6th century, Old Irish was written with the, old, uh, with the uh, Roman alphabet and the ogham disappeared. Um, the place that you can find, like an example with this, is the Finn's window and uh, the Ogham strip script itself is in the Book of Ballymote. And the Book of Ballymote was written in the uh, 1300s. I think it was 1360. I can't remember the exact date. But um, so we, we've got that little bit of something to start out with. That's kind of a very uh, large... Uh, place to start if you want to look at and take the journey of what the uh, uh, Ogham is. Now, some people will say, well, is the Ogham a cut and dried thing? No, 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 no. As an example of what I mean by not being cut and dried, there's more than one type of Ogham. Matter of fact, workable within various texts and things now, uh, there are as many as 27 different types of ogham. There are ogams of regions of your face. There is ogham that can be used on your fingers. There is bird ogham. Uh, there is uh, different mandalas that are used to kind of uh, encapsulate the ogham in the sacred year, which is mainly uh, one of the, gra the pictographs that you can find in uh, the mid, uh, excuse me, the Magician's Companion, it's got a pictograph in there of the Unhewn Dolmen, which is something that I highly recommend people check out. Um, so there is the, the idea of the, the Oum itself being one strict thing um, is, uh, you know, there's there's many different kinds of Oum. Also, in the number of fews that you have, an Ogham few is a, a lot of uh, back in those times that people were starting to work with it, other than putting it onto a uh, stone, were branches. Branches would be cut into pieces, various sacred woods, yew, ash, birch, whatever, and they would be wristed and carved into um, uh, the uh, fews themselves. And there are different Ogham systems that have a different number of fews. The two main ones that are uh, uh, disseminated out there, you have the Bay Lue Neon, which is uh, uh, one of the first ones, and then you have another one which isn't used as much. Um, it's called the Voivoloth, and we'll I'll put some uh, links and things to some of those stuff uh, after the class so you guys can look at that. But um, and another thing, as far as like whenever you're reading Ogham. There's two ways to read it. There's ways where you're reading it up and down, and then horizontal. Now, if you're reading Ogham up and down, you're reading from the bottom to the top. You don't go from the top down. You're reading from the bottom to the top. And then whenever you are reading it horizontally, you're doing it from the right to the left. Um, also, uh, just a if you've ever seen Ogham written, at, written down, uh, there are... Uh, four, well, there's four true sets of Ogums that are the first uh, four sets, and then there's a fifth of five different uh, considered to be consonants or, or extra, extra fuse that aren't necessarily attached to the rest of the Ogum. And what it is is whenever you look at that line, by the way, that line is called the whale's back. So whenever you're reading Ogham, it's going to be written either to the left or to the right of the whale's back. And whenever you're looking at it, it's you're going from the bottom to the top. Um, also, legitimately, well, kind of legitimately, um, it's been said that only the first five Ogham are actually named after trees. The rest came later, other trees that were associated with them other associations were given to them so um, you know but it's like so it's it's that you've got some that will not have uh, that will only have those first five associations and then the rest of them are suggested but the ones that that go with each one are those first five which is Beth Lewin, uh, Fern Sale and so on 
Um, and uh, so you have all these different variations and types of, of OM and I think if you're working with them and it's here, something that you're new, start simple, go slow, because like I said, when we were working with uh, the Ogham's readings and the tarot deck that we worked with the other night, one thing that you have to do is because a lot of people get very intimidated by working with a divinatory tool. And because this is more than just a divinatory tool, the Ogham is, I think Ogham is magical beyond just divination which we'll get into that here in just a little bit. Um, but it's like uh, you don't want to take off, you don't want to bite off more than you can chew. You start small, you type, take little chunks. And some of those little chunks will just give you some more information here. Um, we have the, uh, so also another thing is when Ogham is written up and down, it's one of two ways. There are uh, scales of Ogham that are written with lines to the left or right of the uh, whale's back, or there are derivations of uh, the Elgin that sometimes uh, the vowels use dots rather than lines intersecting the vertical axis. So um, you have the uh, first five, you have each of these of these segments of the um, uh, Elgin are broken up into fives. So the first uh, so the first set, four sets, that's 20, and then the last five are the ones that are the incidentals, the ones that are kind of stuff that's been um, uh, added later. And you have, uh, it goes like this, Bay, Lewis, Fern, Saul, Nin, which basically is Birch, Rowan, Fern, Willow, Ash. That's the first ECME. And to spell that, it's A-I-C-M-E. The second ECME and this is going from the bottom to the top, is Huoth, Dur, Tin, Kull, and Court, which is basically uh, uh, white thorn, oak, holly, hazel, and the apple tree. And those, those first two ecme, if you're looking at them on the whale's back, the first ecme, all of the strikes, those are the lines, go from the, uh, on the right is the whale's back. And when you're looking at them, you're looking at Bay first, and you're looking at Nin last. So Bay starts with one slash, and when you go up to Nin, it's uh, four slashes. So you've got one, two, three, four. But it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, excuse me. So that's five in that uh, derivation. Now, when you look at the next uh, set, which was Huaf, Dur, Tin, Kul, and uh, Court, everything for that, is written to the left side of the whale's back. So you've got those two sets of ACME right there that um, uh, are facing each other that way on uh, the whale's back. Those two ACME, those are the one and two. Now the third ACME goes like this. It's Muen, Gort, Getol, Strafe, and Rus. Now when, and these are Vine, Ivy, Broom, Blackthorn and Elder. Now, when you're looking at these last two, uh, this one of the last two of the Acme, all of the strikes are on are horizontal, and they're on both sides of the whale's back. So, when you're looking at the very first one, Muon is uh, one horizontal strike that goes through the uh, completely through the whale's back. So you're going to have a strike that's on one side and you're going to have a strike that's on the other. So when you go from noon all the way up to Rus, it's one strike, then two strikes, then three strikes, then four strikes, then five strikes. And each one of those strikes that goes through the whale's back are all at a horizontal angle. Okay. And the last uh, ECME is uh, Elm uh, N Er, pardon my pronunciations again, uh, Edad, and this last one is hard to pronounce. It looks like uh, Udad. Okay, and basically I'll give you the tree names for them. They are Pine, pine Furs, Heath, Aspen, and Yew. Now, looking at this last egg me, the whale's back goes straight up and down, but when you're looking at the strikes for this, these are 
each strike is one, two, three, four, and five. But instead of being on a horizontal angle like this, the strikes of the ogum go this way, perpendicular from one through five. Okay, so you have that. And in some cases, mostly in in uh, uh, in manuscripts, if anybody has written something uh, that isn't any of the ogum. Uh, place names and places and things like that when they're written manuscripturally manuscripturally pardon my pronunciation they are written from right to left and even when you're uh, going from right to left with these they are still the strikes are either on one side of the whale's back or they are on another and even the ones that, that need to be um, horizontal and the others that have two two strikes uh, to a concurrent strike that goes through both sides of the whale's back is uh, also important. Also, the last five, which is its uh, uh, the the very last um, set of letters, the fifth group of letters is called the forfida, and the forfida has uh, a which looks like a and the the in this the uh, whale's back is not straight up and down. This last egg is horizontal. So when you're looking at it, you have five different um, uh, symbols that go across. The first one is A, spelled E-A, and it looks like an X. And then uh, next to that, you have O, or o it's uh, O-I, and it's uh, shaped like a uh, pair of triangles up against each other. And then you have URL which is a squiggle that kind of uh, curls under itself. And then you have Aya, which is a pair of X's. And then you have A-E, which is Umachal, which looks like a kind of like a, a, a tic-tac-toe boxes, three lines uh, up and down, then three lines across. Um, and it's like those are, it's, it's ancient. We can at least say that you know uh, we are, we are modern people working with ancient symbols to us because of the fact that even though you know these were supposedly brought around and brought to our attention in the book of Ballymote, which as a matter of fact, for those of you that are interested in learning a little bit more about that, you can go online and either a order uh, uh, condensed copies of the of the book of Ballymote. They're few and far between, and a couple of the sellers that have it, have it are um, uh, not overly, they're not overly expensive, but you're not going to get them for cheap either. But also, if you just want to check, check them out on your computer, you can purchase them or find them in PDF form uh, as well, and I highly recommend that you check that out. Also, the idea of the Finn's window is very important because for those of us that are, uh, you know, ad, uh, ad, ad, advancing and moving forward in our Druidic studies, one thing that I always recommend before you do any kind of magic or, or any kind of working is learn about yourself. Learn about how you can relate to the world, how you relate to uh, the gods and things like that. And one of the ways that you can start doing that uh, magically is through meditation. Um, how many here meditate at some point during the week? Send me some thumbs up. If you're one of the group of people that can uh, sit down and just, and meditation doesn't necessarily mean sitting for two hours with your knees crossed and, and you know, uh, chanting Om or whatever. Meditation can be as simple as five minutes just sitting quietly and just, you know, not thinking about anything and just, you know, letting yourself be. There's hundreds of different ways to meditate, so I'm not the one to tell anybody how to meditate. I have my own ways, but, um, I mean, it's like, that's, that's it's important. It builds, like I was talking about, our spiritual muscles, um, our psychic muscles, our abilities, those things, they get adapted and they get strengthened the more that we use them, okay? So working with the ogum, I think one of the things that is important is taking an ogum a day, and you can make your own. Uh, it's not hard to go out in the woods and find some tree limbs that have fallen. 
and uh, wristing your own fuse. Uh, and then I would take them, cut them in equal lengths, uh, uh, take and um, whittle some of the bark off and knife to inscribe with it uh, each one of the one of the symbols and then go in there with some kind of a natural uh, stain or a paint to kind of darken the the ogham itself so that you can read it and then shellac it or seal it so that it doesn't split or break Oh, okay, you're putting it in there like that. Good job. I couldn't do that. There's still a lot of stuff that I'm learning about uh, uh, putting uh, uh, examples of stuff in. I'm eventually going to get better at this, but thank you for putting that up there. Um, so, yeah, you can make a whole set for yourself, and then once you've got that, you can use it for divination, but another thing is what I recommend is using them as tools for meditation. They're not just for finding out what's going to happen next Saturday when you go to the basketball game or whatever. They're for using to, you know, strengthen our interior uh, spirit, soul, mind, the whole nine yards. Let me take a drink here real quick. Welcome to everybody. Holy crap, we've got 275 people here. I'm glad to have everyone here tonight. Oh, God, that's good. Ah. Whew. All right. Um, so, uh, also, there are places that are online that you can uh, uh, get, like, a, a, a blueprint of what the Finn's window looks like. You can see it on that picture that I put up for the class. But you can expand that, and you can take and make yourself a disc out of some hardwood you know if you have a shop or some kind of uh, woodworking tools you can take and make your own fins window or you can go to any of these hobby shops that have circular blanks and you can take and use a compass and uh, strike out the uh, circles that go on fins window and another thing if you look at fins window um, you'll notice something that's very important is that the idea when you're looking at the uh, egg meats that are going in a circular uh, motion and around the window is that as they move to the center, if you look at from the outside of the window inward, it looks like the concentric rings of a tree, like the life cycle of a tree's growth and living. So that's another important thing. There's a connection to the trees. And we're going to talk about a lot more stuff that deals with trees uh, in some of our upcoming classes. Um, so, uh, there are books that are out there that I recommend that have a lot of information, and there are books that have little snippets that are worth it. Like the two best that I kind of like about the uh, Ogham itself right now is that the, the small section that you can find in the Magician's Companion, and it's an old, I think it's either a Penguin Press or a Llewellyn book, but it's from way back in the day when Llewellyn was actually a good publisher. And then on the other side, there is a book uh, written by uh, Skip Ellison for, from the ADF that is pretty good. There's, there's a lot of really good information in it, and I like his writing. And for anybody that's looking behind, here we'll go like that, the uh, tapestry that I have um, on my wall is from Ian Corrigan's book, The The Grimoire of Summoning. And basically what this picture is, is the uh, Three Kindreds and the Gate. If any of you guys out there are ADF. I'm personally not ADF, but I have a background with the Hindu Keltria. And this, I love this um, representation that he has. And you can find this online as well. Um, if you look at this, when you see the gate here, when I was talking about the unhewn dolmen, the the uh, pictograph that you find inside of the uh, magician's companion, there is a line that strikes across the bottom of the gate, and going from up from top to bottom and around the sides, the o the ogham are in encircle it, so the gates to magic and to the other world and to the gods and these different places are shown 
all the way around it. So it gives you something to show that the Ogham itself can be a gateway to other realms, to communication with the gods, communication with the ancestors, um, nature spirits, and different things like that. Excuse me. So we're not so limited uh, in that area. And what we're going to do is I'm, I've been thinking about this because magic is like a really, really big topic uh, for Druidry. So what we're going to do is we're going to break this down. But to kind of show you a little bit about what I've been talking about over the last, I don't know, month or so since we even before we started to get kind of locked down or whatever, is this coming Sunday night, I think at around 7 p.m., I'm going to set up a little altar and I'm going to do a solitary ritual that people can you know in you know join in check out watch um, because a lot of people go well what's some of the basis of how you do ritual well you will see how I do ritual and it is uh, I believe that practice makes perfect so whenever you, before you look for a grove or an order or anything like that you need to learn how to work for yourself because when you work for yourself, when you work any kind of magic or ritual, you're strengthening yourself and making yourself a little bit better uh, to be able to attune once you start working with a, lar with a larger group of people. And there are so many types of magic that are done by various druid groves. Um, but the idea is that, uh, like I said before, the differences between magic that is done by witchcraft, wicca, and druidry is the idea that um, wicca tends to be focused more on itself, mo focused on spell work, focused on things that are directly attached to the coven and, and things like that. And also when you're working those kinds of ritual, you tend to be focused more on the dualistic side of things, whether it's working with the god and goddess or whatever, but you don't tend to branch out. The one thing that a lot of druids, not necessarily all, but because I won't say that all druids are pantheists, but a large portion of us are, and we tend to work with the pantheon as it is in its entirety. Uh, mom, dad, aunt, uncle, uh, goddess of healing, the whole nine yards like we went over the gods and goddesses during that last class. And I think it's important to, uh, even in magic, I'm not a person that will leave the gods out. There are parts that are added in, various uh, working, and also just to let you know that as far as, as magically, there are different things that are done by uh, uh, the different types of druids. There are things that the quote unquote white robes, you know, the ones that lead, uh, you know, the rituals for clan and things like that. There's stuff that they do. Then you have rituals, spells workings that are done specifically by and for uh, bards. And then you have the other side where you're dealing with uh, looking spells that look into the future, um, working with herbal components and things like that that come from uh, the Ovate Seer side, which now we're going to start to talk just a little bit about that. So give me just a second. And I've got a notebook that I've had for years right here. I need to get it right here where I can keep an eye on it. And I hope y'all are having a good night. We have 337 people. Holy crap. Thank you, thank you. I love you guys. I love you guys. I really appreciate this. It's good to have people that just want to get together and, and talk and, and, you know, learn a little bit. Okay. Now we talked about the Druid's Code, and there's a lot of stuff that um, uh, is uh, important magically. Now, the one thing that a lot of people get scared about whenever they talk about Druidry or that they, they talk about working Druid magic is the idea that we do s sacrifices. Okay, we're going to talk about that here in just a second. But there are magical representations of sacrifice that are applied to the Celtic people. Um, like I've said, the idea that uh, the romanticization of the idea of being put into a um, wicker man 
that whole thing was just given up by Strabo and a couple other uh, 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 people that had supposedly observed Celtic culture and things. But we'll kind of put that off to the side that the idea of sacrifice for is not something that is a foreign concept. Um, whenever you're, uh, when you, uh, as far as working it in a nefarious ma manner, we don't do that. We don't go out cruising the neighborhoods in a little white van with boxes of bubble gum trying to lure your kids into the back of our van to take them to Baker's Woods on a Saturday night and boil the fat out of them and make flying potions. We're not doing that. Uh, if anybody gets the reference to that, then uh, you you have a uh, uh, great love of, of B-movie cinema, if you know where that comes from. But one of the things is that it says here in my notes, a druid is reborn through the act of sacrifice. I am the son of the man without a father who was buried in his mother's womb, who was blessed after his death. Indeed, death betrothed him, and he was the first utterance of every living one, the cry of every dead one. Lofty Elm was his name. Um, as an example of uh, what a sacrifice would be in a greater context, uh, to ensure a profitable battle between two clans, um, a druid or a druid and a chief of a tribe may go to a body of water, may go to a lake, a stream, a pool, or whatever, and something that is important, an item that is of importance to that uh, clan or to that clan leader, you place it into the body of water and you leave it to the gods as a sacrifice to get the desired outcome that you want in this battle. In that instance, if you're going and you want to uh, be triumphant over your enemies, one of the things that you may sacrifice is a sword. Okay. Um, the uh, the the other things where you know some of the the human sacrifice situation that people have dealt with. One thing that they kind of think that uh, uh, there's possibilities of other instances of, of of ritual killings that were not necessarily done with. Uh, a wicker man type situation. A wicker man, whenever a wicker eff effigy was built, built to be burnt, animals were placed in it. The only time a human would ever be placed inside is if they were bad, if they were evil men, animals, and things like that. But there are other situations where other groups, other tribes, may have uh, different ideas of, of that. And there are, there are instances where we don't know 100% sure about what the situation is but there have been bodies the bog bodies if you've ever seen uh, any of that there have been bog bodies uh, that have been found with um, ropes around their neck ritually strangled um, I don't know if the bog body that was found with or near the Gunderstruck cauldron was in that in that state but there are various places in Ireland Scotland and other uh, places around the world where uh, people were, um, it is believed that they were ritually uh, murdered to, for some reason, to appease the gods or a specific spirit or whatever. But uh, generally, um, those kind of things are not something that uh, we would, you know, that we would uh, uh, go for today. We're civilized, you know, or we, we hope that we're civilized. But that's not to say that you kind of to, to know what we're going to do in the future, we kind of need to look at the past and see what was done so that we can formulate the questions and the way that we want to work. So that's why with working with Ogham, we don't necessarily know everything, but being pagans and being experimental people is it gives us the chance to work with them. So we've got so many direct leaders out there that are putting out work of trance work with Ogham, um, trance work in general, um, different things, different practices that kind of are trying to tie these things together. So if you are really interested about the magical side of druidic practice and the nature of druidry in all of its forms, whether you're in, in a bardic situation or whatever that you're working towards, um, all of these things are like a spider web that connect 
and bring different things together. So it's like, uh, you know, you don't want to limit yourself on where you study. So we're going to get into some of the uh, practices and some of the things that kind of tie it together. And there's a lot. We're not going to go over all of it tonight because, hell, we'd be here for years. But just on the idea that uh, magic is all in common and it depends on where you want to start and what you believe your capabilities are. And uh, one thing is also, we're going to talk just for a second about the morality of magic. I keep getting these questions from people that message me and stuff. So, okay, what is the idea of Druidry versus Wicca and the idea of ain't harm none, do what thou will, um, magically, okay? Here's the deal. Um, we've talked, and we're going to talk some more about it here in just a minute, but we've talked in the past about that there are there's a lot of things that are similar uh, between Druidry and there's a lot of things that are not similar between Druidry and Witchcraft. And one of those things is is the idea that we do not necessarily have to, nor do we tend to, follow that read. Just as it's a, a side note so that you know, and harm none, do what that will, shall be the whole of the law, love is the law, love under will. They attribute a great chunk of that to Dorian Valiente, but where the read comes from originally is Thelemic. Love is the law, love under will, and harm none, do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. That is from the book of the law, which is a Thelemic uh, ceremonial uh, practice. The watchtowers that are invoked in witchcraft are not 100% witchcraft. They are derived from um, Aleister Crowley and the OTO and Thelema and a bunch of these different things. So everything of that, you know, within various uh, tradition traditions of witchcraft are paganism with, with certain things, then the rest of it is things that were borrowed from ceremonial tradition. A good example to check into that is you might want to check out the book High Magic City by Gerald Gardner and it gives you an idea of how he came about things in a story form. You'll see how Gardnerian craft kind of came together and where it got its different parts and pieces and the difference with that is the idea of uh, you know are we uh, the Celts were not in, in the times that they were coming into Ireland they weren't necessarily uh, karma uh, as a world the karma to them there wasn't anything that was really um, in their mind about what, about what karma was um, and karma is basically consequence. So when you look at it that way, um, you know, do druids follow the the read? Subconsciously, we probably do, but on the outside of it, as far as a direct, one hundred percent, are we stuck to what the read says? No, we're not. Because one example is one thing that the druids did, as an example, before battles. Uh, you know, like I said before that one druid would be on a hill and another druid would be on another hill and they would call the lightning and they would call the thunder and they would start uh, you know trying to rile up the other group well screw you we're better than you we're gonna you know we're gonna win for the gods we're gonna do this and this would go back and forth it was called casting satires or lorica which are ritual curses which is basically taunts nanny nanny boo boo we're gonna kill you that kind of thing but it was ritual and it was magical and it was meant to strike fear into the hearts of the enemies and to also be the ones, the druids that cast these lorcas and satires would be the ones that gain the favor of the gods so that their group would come out on top at the end of the day. So when you look at that, um, that shows that even in those times, we weren't necessarily as far as the Celtic peoples and, and the Irish and, and you know people that were on the island weren't necessarily worried about you know what was going to happen to their soul because you know the idea of the soul which we'll talk about that in, the, in another uh, class it's like you know we were there for the glory we were there for the gods and we were there to you know take care of our people yeah people have to if you've got the link put that up there for them they can check that out 
Um, so we've, we've got that right there. We've got the idea that druids are not tied to the reed. So with that said, um, on the other side of it, as humans, and as the fact that we know, um, like looking at the, the, the idea that we talked about with the other world and stuff in the last class, that there is that Anamkara, the oversoul, one soul incarnations. We are not, I, I personally believe that we are not going to intentionally danger the continuation of our soul by doing stupid things. So what that means is, well, it, well that's, that's, uh, that's how well you learn. People do stupid things regardless. That's the learning process of living life until we die. We're going to do great things, we're going to do not so great things, and we're going to do horrible things. But the amount and the and to the severity of the way things are, that's up to each individual. That's how we live our life. That's the way that we do things. So um, the idea of you know um, uh, you know druids being love and light. We love people and we like the idea of you know that that being people being under the light of the gods and stuff like that. That's great. But we also realize one thing I've noticed is. Um, uh, also, there is a derivation, yes, the uh, witchcraft does follow various uh, dark side-esque things that go with the idea of the gods, like Hecate, uh, New Moon, all these different things, which is cool. We do the same thing uh, in more degrees in Druidry because we realize that all of us and the gods and the nature spirits and the ancestors and these different things, we all have dark sides as well. That's the thing that gives us balance, which we talked about balance. Uh, the, uh, as an example, a druid maintains order and balance. The gods must be worshipped and no evil done and right behavior maintained. So we do have things that predate, predicate our magic uh, to kind of give us an idea of what we should and what we shouldn't do. In other words, the good old gamer adage, don't be a dick. That means don't be mean to people out of spite and do things just because it gives you a rise. You, when you do something, you have an intent and a purpose. Um, and also, whenever you do right things, you get right results. As an example, a druid is honored by the people. Among all the Gaelic peoples, generally speaking, there are three sets of men who are held in exceptional honor. The bards, the vates, and the druids. The bards are singers and poets. The vates are in natural forms while the druids in addition to natural philosophy study also moral philosophy so whenever as an example like people ask well what did the druids do as far as uh, societal societally well we advised kings we advised uh, leaders of uh, provinces we did these different things but it wasn't just you know on the business side of things sometimes there were deals that were morally Things that needed to be dealt with that the Druids would advise and help with. So um, we were kind of like early psychologists. We were the ones that whenever a king was, um, you know, having a bad day, we would go in and listen to their trials and tribulations and try to set them back on the right path. Because when you do that, you bring honor to yourself, you bring honor to your king, and you bring honor to Ireland. So by, you know, knowing when to do right you'll get right results when you do wrong or the quote unquote whatever wrong happens to be you're gonna get those results too even magically um, uh, and so we're gonna talk about some of these processes we're also gonna talk about some of the steps that go through some of these and then later on as far as actual practice and how to work it we're gonna do another class probably within the next couple of weeks that deals with the functional and operational side of these magical ideals and I will say that for me some of these things I kind of gravitate to and others I'm still learning like I say I've been at this since 1993 is in pagan, paganism in general been working as a druid since about 1999 or I got I was uh, brought into the Hinge Keltra in 1998 left in 2000 or 2001 started the order of standing oak in 2001 and then have been going till now and through all this time i 
still am learning. That's why I love it because there's things that I don't know. And like I say, these other authors and writers, if you get a chance to, to go through the, some of the books that we talked about on the, the show where I talked about different Druid books to start for people, well, there's some stuff that is a little bit more advanced um, that you want to look into. There's stuff by um, Kasura. There's stuff written by Kirk White. There's stuff written by Skip Ellison. Um, there's stuff by so many different Druid authors, Emma Restall or and so on. So one book that I recommend right off the bat is uh, uh, Thorson's Principles of Druidry by Emma Estall Rohr at Restall Orr. Very good book. Um, and then the other thing is not just those books, but you want to go into the historical and some of the things that kind of tie into how it came up through Ireland proper, like the Book of Ballymo, the Libra Gabala, um, uh, the Dendesentias. Dendesentias are place name stories. Whenever you are talking about a well or a river or a town or a village or whatever, uh, bards and various various ones that were within the region would come up with what's known as Dendesentias and it's spelled D-I-N-D-S-E-N-C-H-A-S, which basically translate to place name stories. And some of them are just so freaking cool. Um, and then there's poetry. There's a lot of poetry that isn't necessarily just verse to uplift, but a lot of poetry was written to inform um, magical poetry that had purpose uh, within workings and different things like that. Um, excuse me. So, and then we're going to talk, uh, once we start to go into dealing with uh, the trees and the elements, which we're going to deal with, uh, how the, the Celts dealt with the idea of the elements. Uh, you'll get to see how the uh, Wheel of the Year comes into it, the fire festivals, and these different things, and how it all ties together. That's the one thing that I like about paganism and Druidry in specific, is the fact that there's everything that ebbs and flows and works into each other, and you don't know it until you start seeing these little kernels of pieces of things that uh, come together. As an example, you have the idea that you've seen the Druids when they go to gather mistletoe. There's a lot of lore to that. There's a lot of things that we've done modernly as um, Druids that have come to us to, to do our own rituals now for the gathering of uh, mistletoe, uh, the gathering of vervain on the next night, um, different things different feasts and things throughout the year uh, to celebrate the gods in various situations. So we are not just an inactive people. We are Druids to a degree, maybe not at a high degree, but I believe that Druids tend to um, are a little bit more into overdrive on certain ritual aspects with the earth and things, the ancestors and such. Um, than compared to a lot, not all, but a lot of different Wiccan and Pagan traditions. There are others that I've seen that are just chugging right along and just developing these things. And if you've had, if you've had any exposure to magical working, one thing that you know is you're going to get one of two things is going to happen when you do try to work magic, regardless of the system. It's either a you're going, it's going to work and you're going to experience it, and you're going to see it, and you're going to see it, and you're, you're, it's going to register. Or, on the other side of that scale, it's not. Okay? And people, before we get into the magical part of this, don't be afraid to, 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 to try. Trying is the main thing that a lot of people that are new to Druidry or Wicca or whatever, they get scared. They are, they're afraid that if they do something wrong, that they're going to have some kind of magical backlash that is going to place them in danger or whatever. Well, here's the thing. Um, specifically, if you're working something heavy, like if you're working Western ceremonial magic or whatever, you've got to know how to do various protections and some of these other things because when you start working with summoning beings or gods or spirits of place or whatever, you kind of need to know what you're doing 
I know what all of the light switches and things that need to be turned on and off uh, during the application because if you don't take the time to actually uh, you know plan out what you're going to do and you know make sure that you're confident that you can perform it just because you plan out a ritual and or, or a magical operation and then once you look at it from a distance you may not be able to pull it off and that's okay at least you've got it written down and you've got an idea you want to start but that's another thing is whenever you work magically to get those results that you know are results you start small you don't necessarily work you don't go from the top down you go from the bottom up you start small and you get bigger and bigger and bigger until you become more magically adept and another thing by doing that is pretend that you're a Rayovac battery that's out of juice whenever you work ritual and magic that starts small and you get those successes as you work this magic and you get successful with whatever you're doing whether it's divination or magical meditation or a communication with the gods or trance work or whatever you're building your your meter is going up you're filling up that battery and eventually you're going to be charged up so that you're going to be later on as you have practiced and worked your chances of success magically in an operation are going to be uh, uh, more successful. Another thing preparatory wise before we talk about magic uh, with this is the idea of what to do beforehand. First you've got to study. Second you've got to kind of map out what it is that you want to do. You've got to be specific because here's the deal intent and sp uh, specification and idea um, while it's ruminating in your head that's all building up before you even verbalize or work out what it is you're doing you're adding to it the magic ha starts before you start so you have to know how to you know visualize in your mind what you want to happen and yes visualization is a part of it but it's also the idea of uh, I believe magic is not abstract. It's not an idea of like everything is in our head. Everything is not in our head. When we go outside and we go into the world, that's not in our head. That's out there. That's real. We exist. The world exists. So when you're working with a magical uh, uh, idea, you have to realize that to get it to work, you have to believe that it exists. You have to be able to put that belief into action through various practices and things. And uh, you've got these people that are and I'm going to put this out there. You've got people that are out there that say, well, good magicians and good people that work magic in, in pagan formats and whatever don't need anything but themselves and their mind. and They can just do all kinds of great magic. Okay, here's the deal about that. Some people, yes, you're supposed to be able to work magic at the drop of a hat and not need anything to help. They say, you know, the bells and whistles are crutches. We need crutches. Sometimes we're not able, we're babies, we don't walk. So if we want to stand up before we're five years old, we do need crutches and things to help us up. So thinking of it not necessarily as a crutch, but these are symbols, ideas, and things that our mind can register. When we hear the sound of a bell, whenever we see a candle flame, whenever we see a specific image, whether it be an uh, image of a goddess or an ogum, or any other kind of magical script, or a smell or a stone those things may not necessarily quote unquote be needed but they help uh, help people connect the dots to uh, connect their uh, connection to the gods and the universe and what it is that we're trying to do and regardless of all of that other things you have to um, uh, be in the right frame of mind okay um, I recommend several things. One, don't do magic when you're sick. One thing about that is, A, it drains your own body. It drains your mind. And a lot of times, if you're trying to do something a little bit beyond your means and you are in a position where your physical health is not at its peak or at, as peak as it can be, you run the risk of, A, having the magic backfire or also, not just the idea of having the magic backfire, but working something that can adversely affect your health and make you feel even worse. So the idea for that is 
work magic when you feel physically good. Okay, let me get a drink here. Next, your mental state. When you work magic, your thoughts and feelings can affect the outcome of what it is that you're working. So, for that, I recommend that people do not necessarily work magic when they're depressed, sad, angry, anything that is uh, a negative situation in life that you're dealing with, kind of work through that. You can meditate because meditation helps a lot. If, you're, if, you, if you have depression, if you just have a lot of things that don't jive right in your mind, you just don't feel right about things, you can do little readings for yourself with your cards and your stones and things like that. You can do these things that can kind of give you insight about why you're feeling this way, why you're angry all the time, why you're stressed, and all these different things. Then, as you can kind of put that behind you and not be in that mental state, you don't want to be fatigued, you don't want to be sad, you don't want to be depressed, you want to be in, in, a, in a stable situation. You want to be, you know, you may not be running around singing zippity doodah all day, but you at least want to be able to know that everything is okay and the situation right now is the way that I would like it to be, so let's go ahead and do this. Once you have yourself where you're not in a physically bad state and you're not in a mentally bad state, you also have to, other than you know, writing out what it is that you want to do magically, you also have to prepare your body. Okay, and we are 90% water. Um, the rest of it is bone and flesh and all these different things that make up our our uh, physical form. And one of the things that I always recommend uh, before uh, any heavy magical workings or any uh, even uh, workings with at moon times and different things like that is what I do and I don't look at because I have gained a lot of weight but one thing that I try to do is before every ritual within at least six to eight hours uh, I try not to eat or drink anything other than water and anything major I try to fast for 24 hours before I work ritual and that the only things that I allow myself to eat if I get hungry at any time before the ritual or working happens excuse me is I allow myself some uh, pure honey and some uh, whole grain bread something that not necessarily heavy um, and you don't necessarily want to eat heavy meals uh, cakes and cookies and ice creams and all these different things right before a ritual matter of fact what I do with people is like um, I can is what we do is we go through our situation get everybody together for a ritual we do ritual and then afterwards we eat because the idea is after you have worked and you've had all that energy built from whatever it is that you're doing um, you need a way to ground it and you sometimes you can't ground it by just putting your hand to the earth and letting the energy uh, leave out through your body and your feet. Eating food and drink is what can help you come back to this, you know, to this reality. Can help your body to, uh, you know, adjust to the energy that it's just had. And another thing is, if you can, uh, you know, eat as healthy as possible. Uh, even you know, up, let's say a week before, try not to eat as much junk food as you normally would. Not saying to cut it completely out, but if you know that you've got something that you really want to work on, whether it's a long trance session or these various other things you want to work through, clogging your body up because it's like basically what you're doing is uh, you're making yourself not so good of a conductor of magical energy. That's another thing. It's like you drink lots of water. Although I'm drinking whiskey and Dr. Pepper right now. I still have water over here on the table next to me that I've been drinking all day. So this is my treat for the evening. But by doing that, drinking that water, it lets your blood flow through your body. It lets your heart work better. It lets your brain work better so that you're better prepared for whenever you actually do ritual or trance or whatever. Now we're going to get into the section of the evening where my Gaelic is going to be horrible. There's going to be all kinds of things that we're going to talk about that are going to have Gaelic names that are Gaelic uh, concepts that are horrible. 
Um, but eventually, one day I hope to find somebody that can teach me the correct way to, to speak so that I don't butcher it so bad. That's one thing like ADF and various other groups are so proud that they've been able to do uh, rituals and workings in Gaelic like all the way through. And I haven't been able to do that yet even all these years because uh, Gaelic to me in certain spots I have this 30% understanding thing. I can get it and whatever. But the other 70% it's just like looking at a blank wall. It's like Chinese written all over it. And so eventually I need to learn to be able to implement it more in ritual. And the other thing is uh, somebody says, well, to, to do to do Druidry, do I have to speak Gaelic? Do I have to include it in every magical working, in every um, uh, meditation that I work? If you have the ability to speak Gaelic, knock yourself out. Go for it. If you have the ability to pick up new languages, there are so many places online that you can study and you can learn and you can get the, the, the rudiments down for you know something you might not be able to do an hour long ritual in Gaelic or you might be able to but at least something where you can pare it down to where you can speak it because the Gaelic language is beautiful um, uh, you know the Irish they call it the Irish language they don't necessarily call it Gaelic and it's not Gaelic it's Gaelga G-A-E-I-L-G-E -E. Gaelga I love it um, also there are parts of Ireland that are more adept at it than others. I mean, it is a national language, but there are places like in the south that's called the Gael uh a conglomeration of villages, counties, and areas that are just spot on. That's basically, they can speak English, but basically their primary language is various different um, derivations of the Irish language. And there are several different dialects. So uh, you need to look into that too, you know, which is easier for you to learn. Um, and there are, I, there's uh, uh, different versions of Scots Gaelic. There's different versions of Welsh Gaelic uh, and stuff like that. So um, you have all of these different languages that you can look into even before you start working magically to see if it's something you want to do. I know many of our viewers are probably fluent in German or Swedish or Spanish or whatever so it's like they have the predisposition to be able to you know go and learn a new language and if anybody out there is a Gaelic teacher I would love for you to get a hold of me because I would like to learn more I'd like to get better so without further ado on that aspect we're gonna start talking about some of the types of, of, of magic um, that are uh, important for Druid, and, and we've got some notes here, I'm going to kind of read this to you. Druid has the strong and healthy findings of an awareness of nature and the spirit and deities who exist in nature, seen or unseen. A Druid must understand the language that nature uses to speak its wisdom. All else flows from that. Druid magic has a votive characteristic. The act of beseeching a deity, spirit, creature, and a spiritual being to aid in the accomplishment of a service in return for an offering often results in magic. Druids often use trance and ecstasy to achieve and will their purpose as well. But in the myths and legends, little attention is paid to summoning or controlling spirits or gods. Instead, the druids sought communion and communion. And here are some of those. Now here's the thing, um, ceremonial magic deals with a lot of uh, the Goetia and things like that, and that is summoning, and that is trying to control spirits for a magical application and things like that. As pagans and as Druids, we don't want that kind of a relationship with the ancestors and the nature spirits and things like that because that puts us in a wrong footing, okay, and that's you know we want to be in communication and in harmony with things so that we can get a better expected outcome so don't think that whenever you're at the ritual that you know whenever you're asking the gods to you know watch over things and stuff like that that you can tell them to do something because the gods are going to laugh at you they don't do anything they don't want to so the idea that we can control them is ludicrous you can't control 
anything any more than you know uh, you could control another person beyond what they let you and I don't think that the gods are just going to immediately let you you know have that privilege to be able to control them because we're mortal they are who they are we are who are we are who we are so here's some of those types of magic that we're talking about the very first one is called Aisling and it's spelled A-I-S-L-I-N-G Aisling is a dream or vision from the sky perhaps Aisling may refer to altered states of consciousness so dreaming meditation um, uh, the whenever it says that uh, to work magic we need to raise the Kundalini through uh, alcohol or spirit or incense or uh, those that smoke marijuana or use psychedelics or different things. Um, Aisling um, uh, is a part of that idea of an altered state or an altered consciousness. The next part is imbus, and this is very important. Inspiration, poetic frenzy, the fire in the head that Amergen speaks of and found in the bar also and it's also talked about in bardic tales uh, a good book for anybody that can find it it's kind of hard to find you can order it on um, Amazon and I think possibly from uh, Llewellyn is a book called fire in the head by Tom Cowan and it is a good book to uh, kind of get an idea of what Amergen was talking about uh, when he's talking about inspiration the poetic frenzy and the idea of what is the fire in the head. Next, we have the idea of something called Ectra, which is E C H T R A, and basically it means adventure, expeditions and journeys that occurred on sacred sites. The type of magic, this type of magic happens accidentally or by chance to heroes, warriors, and hunters. The idea of Ectra is kind of uh, evident in the story of Neve and Oshin. When Oshin went into the woods with his brothers to go hunting, he was found by a uh, young fairy princess by the name of Neve. And Neve says, I would like you to uh, come and uh, meet my father. You know, we, we've got things that we need to uh, have taken care of. Would you come with me? So Neve took Oshin into the underworld where he uh, stayed with the fairy folk for 300 years. And eventually Oshin said, wait a minute, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here, but I need to go back to my people. Well, the king of the fairies said, well, the thing about that is whenever you go back, um, you won't be able to uh, uh, to continue to, to stay immortal you are going to have to you can't touch the earth again he left the underworld came out and he was on a horse heading back to his people and on the side of the road was a couple of men working uh, in a field and their plow had broken and O'Sheen said, well, okay, maybe I can help you fix that plow. Well, when he stepped off of his horse and touched the earth, he immediately aged and died because of the fact that he didn't um, take heed of what the uh, uh, fairy king had said about, you know, you can't touch the earth again because if you do, your immortality would go away. But that that's also kind of a, a uh, morality tale of, do we, you know, other than the fact that we know that we have our oversoul, we have that one, one soul, many incarnations, you know, for those of us that have the choice, would we rather stay on that horse and be immortal, or would we want to help our fellow man, to help our tribe, um, you know, in a time of need, and that's kind of the thing, which would you balance, your immortality, or helping someone that you care about your own people and so and I've always said that you know immortality would be great in its own self without knowing the way that we do after we die but I would get off the horse 
I, I'm, I'm from the country. I've lived in the country. There's pictures in the Missouri Druid School of my farm where my where I kind of grew up. So it's like this is something that I do. I've worked on plows. I've worked on tractor plows. I've worked on horse-drawn plows when I was much younger. I'm 53 now, so it's I've had some years where I was able to do that at my grandmother's place. So that's an idea of magical adventure. Um, a lot of that is through dreams. Sometimes that is those those are those dreams that I don't know if you have these. Anybody can thumbs up if they have. But you've had those dreams where it seems like you are a hero in some kind of epic quest or some kind of epic modern fight or something like that where you come out on top at the end of it all. You know, and you wake up and you go, oh crap, that was just so cool. This, this, and this. Um, a lot of these things that happen like that as far as things that have been recorded in the stories are always uh, uh, taken from magical ideas. So the idea of Ektra or a adventure is um, actually pretty accurate and pretty well with the way that the Celtic peoples were. All right, so we're going to move on to the next. Okay, my favorite one. Let me get a drink here real quick. Everybody asks me, what do you call druid magic? Well, this is where I'm going to butcher, probably. But, um, Dreyacht, which is D-R-A-I-O-C-H-T, which means magic translated, it means what druids do. Or, um, uh, it is Gaelic for druid, druidry, and druidism, in a, in a, in a sense. So whenever somebody asks you what it's called, that is a good base to start. Okay? Um, and that covers everything that we're talking about. When you have this an umbrella of the idea of the gods, uh, the sovereignty of Ireland, all these different things, so Ireland as the center of the universe, some of these different things, um, it, that that's where it starts. Also in another class, we're not going to put it so much into this one, but we're also going to talk about uh, Druid magic and Celtic cosmology because there's a lot of things that are tied cosmologically into how we work magic. But we're not going to be able to talk so much about that tonight. But that is something that is important when we deal with uh, magical procedures and things like that. Um, then we have, excuse me, my nose is really itching tonight. The next uh, thing that we have to look at is Thryn. And it's spelled F-I-R-I-N-N-E, -N -N -E, which is basically um, the idea of truth or justice, the binding force of nature or the way of nature. Um, so that is one part that is kind of added into what uh, uh, is used within Dreyat. The following are skills used in Dreyat that can be used to attain, God dang my nose, that can be attained communion with nature. The first that we have on this is Brioche, which is B-R-I-O-C-H-T, a spell largely of fully verbal, that is fully verbal. This spell or charm usually consists of two lines of, of or, or six lines, lines with eight syllables preceded by those with four syllables. So like abracadabra is a, uh, a type of uh, magic word that has a certain amount of syllables in it. This is what you're doing with Brioche. You're doing a spell that is fully verbal, that is split up into a different amount of symbols for each line and are uh, recited. And this would be something that is in the realm of bards. Anybody can do it, but it can, it can be something that is specifically tied to uh, you know, a bardic situation. Then we have uh, Leopard Lanlati, which is L E A. P A I D H, Lapath Lan Ladi, which is L A N L A D H I, which literally means harborage of complete attentions or a secure mindset to do brioche or meditations. The place for performing these was called a libade. My pardon my pronunciation. This was the bed or sleeping place of the poet who was seeking impus. The place would be warded physically and spiritually. 
So basically, if you've ever heard of the concept of the, the sleeping in the stream bed of knowledge, that is basically people would find a shallow stream, and they would lay, and they would uh, meditate on the salmon of knowledge and things like that. And we're going to talk about uh, uh, the nature spirits and animal symbology that is tied to Druidry. But so you've got sleeping in the dream, sleeping in the bed of inspiration, sleeping in the dream bed of, of knowledge. That is the idea and seeking Imbus that way, which is Imbus is another form or another aspect of Awen. Um, and these places that we would do this, the bed or whatever, uh, would be uh, warded physically and spiritually. Another part that is kind of tied to that is the inspiration is if you've ever seen a uh, corn dolly that is made up to look like Bridget and she's placed in Bridget's bed, Bridget's bed is the bed of inspiration. Then you have the idea of the Faustine, spelled F-A-U-S-T-I-N-E, which is divination. This derives from the word seer or faith if it, it is applied to soothsaying and the second sight. And I believe, if you've ever heard of the, the Irish grannies that have the second sight and passing it on to their daughters, th there's more than just the Irish grannies. There's Irish grandsons and all that. And I believe that the second sight is something that is not, it can be inherent in anybody, but the second sight, if anybody has it, you'll A, you'll know it, and B, it's it's very cool. I've known just a couple people in my life that really have it, and um, they. If you, and something about this, another thing that I think is really cool, is there's a lot of magical people that I have met, and I'm sure that you've met out there, um, magical people that are really down with their magic abilities and the way that they work and stuff. They don't brag about it. They don't get on the phone and call people up and say, you know, I'm this great grand poobah, blah blah blah. Uh, for doing these things. They're humble, they have humility, and they just do their best to do what they do and be of help and, and show that they care about people by not, you know, making themselves out bigger than who they are. So there's a lot of people within paganism and various traditions that throw themselves out there on national TV and all these different places and they think they're the shit don't stink. But then when it comes down to it and you put them, you try to put them to the test, well, not necessarily to the test, but you try to, you know, put what they have said to the fire and see if it, if it, you know, works out. A lot of them are so fake, but the people that are real about it, they don't, they don't brag. They just do it, you know, and even them, those that are, are like that, they know that they're not perfect. I'm not perfect. There's things that I know that I can do. There's things that I know that I can't do. And that's the way it is with you. So you always want to work towards your strengths. But also when you're working towards your strengths, there's nothing that says the other stuff over here that I'm weak on, I can practice it. That's why I believe that magic is something that strengthens our soul so that whenever we move our next incarnation, we're a little bit better. We're a little bit better prepared so that as we move magically through the universe, through that time of our first incarnation, till whenever we stop incarnating and become a part of the universe itself, we're building. So magic has the purpose of building our spirit and helping society and mankind and whatever along the way. It's not something, I don't believe that magic has to be 100% selfish. It shouldn't be selfish. It should be, that's why Druids and pagans, we're considered the keepers of the earth. We're the ones that are here to make sure that the waters run clear, that the animals flourish, that the people are fertile, um, that the trees always are reaching to the sky, doing all these things. And whenever we stop caring enough to do that, that's whenever we die as a society because we stop thinking and stop wanting to do these things. And that's what Druids do. That's what various other pagans do is we want to be stewards of the earth and do things the right way so that we have it uh, as a badge of honor for you know taking care of things that we could while we were here but also making things a little bit better for those that are going to have to live here after we're gone so that's another thing we need to think of you know how selfishly are we going to work magically whenever we do it
you know, how much of how much of this magic is for me, and how much of it's for you, and then everything else. How much of it's for, uh, you know, how we deal with the gods and everything else. So we've got that. Then um, we have the next one, which is Siolat, which is et, or Siolat, which is S I U L A C H T. Um, it is a feeling of being magically influenced, not necessarily by Briot. Um, it's like there's something within it that is that is driving you. Spontaneous magical insight, the aha moment. Yes, there are magical things that happen that are the light bulb that goes off over your head. Um, a state of being free, or of being like the not free, being like the fae, which is sealach, which is S E A L A C H T. Um, also, it's uh. There's also a component of this that is tied to the stars. Uh, could be something that's practiced by sailors that have a experience with sailing and reading the stars. It could be a form of, of um, magical astronomy. So we have that part of it. Then we move over here and this is Nila Doriat, which is N-E-A-L. A D O I R E A C H T. And this is divination by clouds. Um, furtively spying, used to detect the actions and movement of an enemy or someone wishing to come to cause harm to an individual or clan, possibly tied to astrology. Movements, looking at things, seeing where. The universe says it's going to be at this certain time, um, but dealing with, uh, you know, seeing the clouds, seeing the way the stars are um, in that way also, and how to use that as a means of uh, determining when you go to battle, when do you go on raids, when do you go on hunts, uh, and all these different things, even to a degree when do you plant crops and stuff in that realm. So you've got that. And then we go into the... Uh, next uh, set and some of these ones that we're getting ready to go into are a little bit more intense but they, they all tie to these other various forms of magic that we're talking about and we have the diketal incantation this is d-i-c-h-e-a-d-a-l incantation this is a way of achieving in the Im imbus <clears throat> by understanding each part of a given situation separately so that it's combined meeting may be better understood. This technique also gives insight to hidden agendas and its root causes. Then you have the Daikido del Chenre, which is D-I-C-H-E-T-A-L-D-O, then the next word is C-H-E-N-N-A-I-B-H, incantation of the fingertips. If you've ever seen a wizard on a fantasy movie speaking and moving his hands in different gestures, and different things like this whenever you see the hands move and the abracadabra and these various things uh, Daikido Doshane is the incantations of the fingertips so there is a little bit of, of, of stories that have been told over the years that talk about people moving their fingers in different patterns and things which is uh, usable for uh, working magic and incantations and spell work even for druids then we have the next set, which is Hudicht, with H U I D E A C H T, which is traveling through life or death, applied to journeys that go beyond boundaries and pierce the veil of reality in this realm. So for me, that is kind of a form of astral projection, doing it to where you're not going out so far into the ether and into the universe, kind of like if you've ever done. Uh, meditation or an ash projection where uh, you journey across the earth you take yourself to, to Egypt or these other places but it's kind of like a real-time thing where you leave your body and you go through this um, so you're breaking the veil of reality so if you were to go from here to Cairo and you could see people walking the streets of Cairo um, in this reality in this earth realm that we're in right now that is a form of Hadith Next, we have the Tavil, which is T-A-M-N-H-E-A-L. 
It's a form of trance in which visions occur, usually in, in, uh, induced by an herb. An example of that, not necessarily by an herb, but um, uh, the Oracle at Delphi is a form of this. The Oracle at Delphi was not uh, induced by an herb. The Oracle at Delphi sat over a sulfuric vent and sat over that vent and inhaled those fumes from that sulfuric vent and was given visions and utterances. So Tamil is a type of trance and visions that occur through the the uh, ingestion of various herbs, whether it's vervain or mistletoe or other things. And just as a uh, just as a little slight thing before people start getting into the idea of going get uh, mistletoe, mistletoe the herb itself, um, the real thing, the plant and the berries and so forth and stuff. You can use it on your altar and uh, various things like that, but you don't want to eat it. Don't eat it. It's dangerous. If you get the real thing, and if you can get it any kind of fresh, and there are various places, uh, just so you know, mistletoe is a parasite. Um, it is what's found on trees uh, a lot of times after, uh, well, it's, it's said that it's found after lightning strikes, but there are times that it's not. It's just mistletoe itself is a parasite that attaches itself to various trees and things. So you want to be very careful. But on the other side of that, there are mistletoe extracts that are food grade. You need to do your research and see which ones are the most uh, efficient, most cost effective, and safe. Because even then, food grade mistletoe, for those that are not used to it, and we don't know what our allergies are. So I'm telling you right now, this is not an advocating for you to get this. I'm just saying you can look into it for yourself and see if it's something that you want to do. But there are ingestible forms of mistletoe that are out there. It's just I'm not saying one way or another that you should or shouldn't do it. I'm just saying in general, the actual plant, if you have some, don't eat it. It's very dangerous. The same way with like eating mandrake or belladonna or any of these other herbs that we know are mainly killers. They will kill you. And some nightshade and some of these different things, they are death's hood. And these are other things you don't, you can use them, but you don't want to eat them, ingest them, or do things that could put yourself in danger. I always advocate for working magic and working ritual as safely as possible. Um, making sure that you have uh, things set up that you can do just in case something happens um, that, you know, have a doctor's office on speed dial, um, be able to, uh, you know, call a doctor, an ambulance or whatever after working uh, magic or something that happens where you get sick. You want to be able to get medical help as quick as possible because, you know, we don't want to do something that we think we can do and end up in the hospital because we really shouldn't have been messing with it. But those, that is something that is doable. Next, we have um, the idea of Corquignoc, and I'm going to spell that wrong, or pronounce it wrong. It is C-O-R-R-Q-U-I-N-E-A-C-H-T. This is where we start to talk about the idea of the crane bag, and this is crane magic, Riot, but also Malakti. Malakti is cursing. Um, uh, It's a different. It's a different. It's a different situation with cursing. A malakti is different than a lorica, um, and we'll talk about some of that on, on another class. But um, uh, if you've ever seen Jethro Tull, uh, whenever he plays the flute, he has the flute like this, and he stands on one leg. That's called the heron pose, and that is part of a magical tradition dealing with crane magic, and uh, brioche. Also, Malakti occurs on one foot with one eye closed, one hand in your belt. This magic is associated with edges of reality and boundaries. So, to the to a degree, whenever you see Jethro Tull or Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull, uh, 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 standing on one foot playing the flute, that is a homage to the Heron pose, which is a part of um, Druidic practice. Um, I'm so big, I'm not going to try to do the hair pose for you guys. I'll fall over and, 
and rumble this building to the ground. I don't really want to do that, but you can practice it. It's uh, it's it's something that's actually pretty fun once you can get the hang of it and get yourself balanced. Next, we have the idea of kumak, which is C U M A C H T, and basically translated, it is power, authority, influence. The term is also used to describe the effect that a mighty one with a great power would have on have on those around him. This was also the effect of Ogum. The Ogum consonants had up on each other while chanting verses. One of the things that uh, certain Druids will chant is the That's A E I O U, but you're doing it in a different order. And you keep chanting, and you keep chanting, and you keep, keep chanting. And as you do this, your consciousness changes. Your connections with the earth and with the gods and different things begin to change, and it goes over and over and over. And it's, it's very intense. It's very cool. Um, you can do it as a kind of a druidic rosary where you can take some beads and write the consonants out, which are uh, the ogham themselves, and put them on a circular string to where you just chant and you work that around and eventually you start to connect and then and another thing well before we continue on with this last little bit that we've got here any of these things that we're talking about tonight I still highly recommend that you keep a journal that you write down your experiences uh, astrological correspondences the whole nine yards because the more that you can keep an eye on how you feel, how you see things as these practices are being done. Um, uh, you can, you know, you can get a great sense of, you know, where you are strong and where you are weak. Um, um, and it says with the linking of one beginning word sound to another. That's what I'm talking. That circular thing, modified the word endings and change the meanings and effect of the words themselves. From this uh, likeness or similarity comes the power of sounds, names, and incantations. So Ogham is important when considering what you're working as with incantations, the sound, the way that you verbalize it, um, that what the names of things are that you're working with, it all connects. So that's an important part of that. Next, we have Miltoriat, which is M I L L T E O R A C H T. Magical attack, term often used in place of destruction, perversion, or spoiling, fits well with Glarm Dicom, which is uh, G L A R M D I C H O M, a poem of great satire and attacking magic. So basically, it's the satires that we were talking about at the beginning where uh, druids would hurl insults and things at each other at a battle. Um, next, we have Goblerdial, which is G-A-B-H-L-A-I-R-D-E-A-L-L. -L -L. Forked attention. Division of consciousness. E-S-P during Samoil, which is S-O-M-H-O-I-L-L. -L. The word relates to summit. This doubles this double is provided with limited ability to continue certain magical actions, while your own attention is diverted to other actions or even worlds, also used for interactions between worlds. It's kind of like if you've ever watched uh, the movie Excalibur, whenever he does the, the charm of making and the the uh, mist of the dragon goes across so that Uther can come across and do what he needs to do. While that was happening, there was diversion going on because uh, he was changed. He was in disguise. And so that was uh, kind of a little bit what this was, just a small part of it. Um, next, we have the idea of Imrama. And Imrama is... Uh, M, uh, Imrama is I-M-M-R-A-M-A, -A, a journey to where the gods live. By shamanic flight, literally sea journey, 
to the Western Ocean is where the islands of the otherworldly paradises are located. If you've ever heard the term to the land beyond the ninth wave, where Menonim takes his boat uh, wave sweeper to open up the, the veil between the worlds, that's what they're talking about. The sea journey, um, and as, as far as the idea of Avalon, um, within our tradition, the Order Standing Up, we don't work, so we, we do work with the Avalonian idea, but we work with the idea of its more ancient name, which is High Brazil, which is uh, uh, Irish for uh, almost the same thing. And it's H Y separation, B R E A S I L. And that's the uh, basis for that uh, version of the other world. Um, so uh, next we have uh, the idea of Niesa Doriach, which is N A G E A S O S A D O R E A C H T. Gaelic words have a lot of letters and some long spelling, so thanks for bearing with me. And it is a form of sorcery and divination concerning the Gius, a magical call associated with uh, birth, the winds, and weather, weather magic. Uh, Gius are generally taboo or interdictions against doing a certain thing, although they may, be, may pertain to a given duty or great work. Uh, the idea of Gius is like when Hercules was sent to do his uh, his uh, uh, journeys where he went and found the Golden Fleece and uh, these different things. He, that was a Gius. It was a quest that he was sent on by the gods to do these different things um, to see, you know, if he was, uh, uh, you know, worthy of, you know, being considered more than just Hera's son. You know, was more than just a half god, more than just a demigod. So, um, a quest or a great work, a great work for a druid could be something as uh, modern wise would be planting a forest. Uh, I've seen so many things online nowadays where people are trying to plant a billion trees by X year or a hundred thousand trees by X year. And if you know anybody that's doing that, support that as much as possible because we need as many trees as we can get. You know, that's the lifeblood and the lungs of our planet. So that's a great work. That's a gius. That's your quest. That's my quest. To, to be better is our quest. It's, it's our gius to do things. Um, next, we have what's called the Shruth Bua, which is S-R-U-T-H-B-H-U-A. Um, the current of Bua, or Viol, which is V-I-U-L. This flow of magical and spiritual power is one of the forces behind G and Philodec. And Philodec is the uh, idea of the inspiration, bardic inspiration, that is Philodec. And that's spelled F I L L I D E C H T. E C H T, excuse me. A druid might direct a stream to sustain a shield of invisibility or to perform a magical flight. Srusbrua is immediate and experiential, it is knowledge and experience. Of the magical. Um, then we have, after that, we have Rune Vurek, which is R E A M F H U R E A C H. Briox set beforehand, which awaits. Uh, so, uh, so, so, and or a trigger. Should such a spell would alert to one to tampering and to ensnare or detain the one who tripped it. So in other words, if you are one of those people that are like me, I don't let a lot of people touch my magical items uh, and books and things, uh, certain specific books, because a lot of people are, they think of us, they think of us as like we're playing D&D &D and things like that. And over years and years of working with a certain book that might have rituals in it or working with a certain thing, you build up your energy in it. And when you have these people that are, quote unquote unbelievers that aren't necessarily sympathetic to the way that we work. Um, they're gonna be the ones, they're gonna get all handsy and they're gonna want to touch our stuff. Now my thing is if you ask me nicely and you know I'm in the mood, sure I'll let you look at my stuff. That's no big deal. But then you have people that have in the past that this has kind of pissed me off. I've had new pagans that have come to my house for ritual 
and come to other houses for ritual that I was priesting and things like that. And they have stolen items off the altar, stolen items off out of my uh, ritual bag my kit that I bring with to set everything up. And I hate that. I hate people who are thieves. But then you have the people that will just sit there and whenever you're not looking, they just start picking everything up and fondling it all over your altar. They start picking up, picking up your cards and all these things and stuff like that. And, and it's good that they're curious, but whenever they don't understand what it is that they're messing with, you know, why they're picking something up and what it is, their, their weird little energies and stuff will rub off. And you never know, um, you know, what that's going to do to uh, a working later on, you know, down the line, whether it's something, that, an energy that they have attached to them is going to be detrimental to you or the people that you're working with because they got a little too handsy and they shouldn't have been touching stuff that they had no business touching without asking first. So there's a process of which you can magic your stuff. You can put wards. You can put uh, little bits of things on there that of course I don't want somebody to get hurt from but I'll just put that stuff on there that would say okay this is something you don't want to mess with. Uh, this book is important. This item is important. You can magic it and you can do these things where you can put wards and triggers and stuff on there to where they're going to look at it and they're going to go, oh, I don't, I don't want to mess with that. Uh, for some reason, I wanted to touch it, but now I don't. You're changing their perception. You're not hurting them. You're not doing anything that's going to physically, you know, uh, put them in any kind of danger. But you are going to keep them off of your stuff and, you know, on to other things. So that's important. And don't be afraid to do that. You can magic your car. If you don't want people stealing your car, you can do that. I've known people that have magic their car because I've known a couple of people that have had really nice cars that even when they sit in their driveway or even being parked in their garage, they still scream to the neighborhood and beyond, steal me because they're not that nice. I've known some people that have had some really nice vehicles. So you basically, anything that is uh, a ward against maliciousness against your items, your home, and yourself, you can do that. There's nothing else that, there's nothing that says that you can't do it. Um, some other things that, let me see here, uh, that we, we're almost to the end of this. Some other things that have gone on are rituals that were, uh, excuse me, that were historically seen. One of them is the tarb face. I'm, I'm gonna tarb face, which is T A R B H F E I S. Uh, have you ever heard of the uh, phrase chewing the fat? Well, that came from a ritual that was basically a uh, kind of like an otherworldly journey, and what that entailed was the person, the druid, or or whoever it was, they would be taken to a grove. Uh, somewhere around their village and what they would have laid out before them there would be a fire and in front of that fire someplace would be a bull hide and the bull hide the uh, recipient of this uh, journey would climb into the bull hide and wrap themselves up and it is said that attendants would uh, sit stand around them whatever and uh, dance drum and chant uh, while the person that was encased in the bull hide would try to seek uh, wisdom, knowledge, uh, go on a journey from uh, the uh, gods. And sometimes one of two things would happen. Either A, some of the bull meat would be with them inside of the, the, the hide, and they would eat, chew on that, and they would chew on that using that meat as a means of kind of helping them get into trance. Or if they didn't have that, they would literally chew on the hide. So that's where we get kind of get the idea of chewing the fat. Um, it was a, a, a means of going on a journey. Um, other things is there are uh, um, ideas that the Celts were, had, did, did have shamanic things that happened. As an example of that is the idea of uh, fire journeying. Where you would start at sunrise, uh, or start at sun, sun, sunset, and, and at sunrise, and sit in front of a, a fire, and watch the flames, watch the 
the logs, watch the wood as it burned down through the night as a means of going through trance to connect with the spirits, connect with the beings of place. And that at the end of it, by the time that the sun rose, that there would be some kind of knowledge gain, that there would be some kind of boon that could have come from it just from being there and in the energy of that fire and, and so on and so forth. So this here that we talk about tonight, the idea of the Ogham and how it affects things, and then the idea of the Druid magic, there's a lot there. And that right there is not doesn't even touch it. There is so much more. Uh, and I'm sorry for anybody out there that does speak Gaelic. Like I said, I knew I was going to butcher it, but just some things are really hard to read. But you get the idea. So there's a lot of stuff that is uh, out there for us to learn. And what we're going to do eventually down the line is we're going to take this and we're going to divide it. There are things that are magical that are workable by the bard. There are magical things that are workable by the quote-unquote druids. And then there are things that are workable for those that are the Sierobates. And we're going to take some time to uh, break those situations down. Um, I want to thank everybody that's come. Holy crap, we've got almost a thousand people here tonight. Uh, thank you for uh, hanging out with me tonight. I'm going to give a little bit of information about some things. And then here in just a minute, we'll be ready to close. But for those of you that are out there that are uh, uh, checking this out and are not a part, I welcome you to come over on Facebook to Missouri Druid School. Just type us in. And if you'd like to join and, and join with us and see what's going on, we've got a lot of people from various traditions. Um, various jerk groups and stuff that are with us now that are just great people, um, you know, disseminating as, disseminating as much information as possible. Um, we've got all kinds of things that have gone on, like this past uh, Sunday, we did the Ogham readings, which are uh, up, and then we've got a, um, another show where we did uh, the books that are essential for a Druid's bookshelf, which we've got a video for that. And then we have the other three classes, which you can check out, that are uh, on video. Matter of fact, uh, I invite you that uh, uh, after this show is, after this stream is over, what I'm going to do is I'm going to process it. Take a little time. It's going to take about half an hour, maybe 45 minutes. I'm going to have to process this down to another format. And then I'm going to place it on my YouTube channel. And my, new, my YouTube channel, for those that are out there that would like to check things out, um, is a pagan perspective all run up together uh, on um, uh, YouTube itself and all of these classes are on there plus um, there were times that I was a interviewer and a blogger on blog talk radio and I have an interview with Dr. Raymond Buckland uh, before she, a couple of years before he passed I also have an interview with uh, uh, Kasur Sarath of the ADF, where we talked about his Book of Pagan Prayer and his Book of Pagan Ritual Prayer and the idea uh, behind ADF's uh, uh, um, look at the way Druidry is in an Indo-European type of thing. So we've got that interview there. We've got uh, other Druid stuff. We've got Samhain. We've got Cardomancy. We've got all these different things. So there's stuff there. So I highly recommend checking that out on Facebook. Um, and announcements, what I'm going to do is, like I say, this Sunday, probably at 7 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. I don't know where everybody's located, but I'm sure uh, various places around the world. So what we're going to do at 7 p.m., it's not going to be very long, but we're just going to do a basic solitary Druid ritual. Um, as an example, if you want to see another one, uh, Ian Corden from ADF has done a beautiful uh, ADF style solo ritual that you can go to the ADF YouTube channel and I believe that it's still there but we're going to do something that's going to be different from his because his ritual is beautiful but there's going to be something that's just going to be simple and easy for people that have no idea you know what it what it is and what it can be and it's like it's it's a starting point you know, if everybody out there that's a little bit scared that, you know, has that hesitation factor that, oh, well, I don't want to do ritual. It's just, it's too much work or it's too scary or whatever. When you see it and you see how 
to me, ritual is an expression. It's beautiful. I've seen so many different priests and priestesses of all kinds of traditions that have worked ritual that is effective, but also, excuse me, whenever you look at it, it's beautiful. It's poetic. It's artful. It's connecting. So this is a place to start. So what we're going to do with this week is we're going to do a short 20, 30 minute small individual ritual. And then next week, we're going to get into another component of working uh, in, in direct practice. We're going to look at the idea of the elements, earth, air, fire, water, and some other things, and another system of elements called the Dwia, which is D-U-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, which is something completely different. And we're going to look at the idea of the cauldrons. There's the cauldrons, there is the elements, there is... Uh, you know, all these different things. We're going to look at the elements, the cauldrons, and how uh, they kind of go with Druid magic. And we're going to also get a little bit into the idea of how trees set into things and a little bit of the cosmology. So the next class is going to be a little bit broader but still contained. And for those that are out there, um, also, because that we are in this situation that we're in right now with the pandemic, everybody, there's been people that have been just so hyped to go do things that we want we to for Beltane. But a lot of us don't have a chance to do that um, because of the simple fact that getting together with more than five people could be bad. So what we've done over the last few years uh, is, and here in Springfield, the Order of Standing Oak has hosted um, at one of our local parks here something called Beltane in the Park. And this year, Beltane in the Park 2020 was going to be held at uh, Phelps Grove Park. We have the pavilion. I paid for the pavilion. We still have the pavilion. If the gods willing, get to where we can get open by May 2nd. But we were going to have ritual and a potluck. Well, we can't do that. It's just I, I have a feeling that we're going to be locked down for a little bit longer which is fine, you know, it's uh, aired to be good on the safe side of things. But having said that, I still believe that even though that we're not going to be able to meet physically, we can still meet virtually. So what we're going to do, and for those of you that are out there, um, you can check it. Beltane in the Park 2020, and it's got a picture of a fairy goddess on it, and that's the event listing, so you can kind of check that out. But the idea of this ritual this year is we talked so much over the last few years about the the, the belt, the idea of belt, Beltane, the, the newness of life, fertility and things for us the, from the ancestors and these other things. But we never really paid attention to the spirits of place and the fae. So this year we're going to be doing something different. We're going to be doing a ritual that is tied to the idea of the fae at twilight and the other world and how that affects the beginnings of fertility in men, women, and everything. So what we're doing is something called Fairies at Twilight. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a virtual potluck. I'm going to sit here and have some nice food and drink and talk with people and do whatever. And then at around twilight time, I'm going to have the altar set up. I've got my robes. We've got the ritual written out. The altar is beautiful. I've got it set up and virtually ready to go. So I'm inviting everyone here that's listening and, and viewing this to uh, join us. That's going to be May 2nd, Saturday, and we're going to start at about 6 p.m. and we're going to be doing ritual between uh, 7 and 7.30 whenever the actual twilight time begins to uh, change around here and that's central standard time just so that you know because there we have various people from all around the world so i invite you to, to join us for that and we've got friends and family of the order that are going to be involved in this that are going to be online and i'm really glad that they're going to be here and then the week after in my kitchen i have a five gallon carboy of blueberry mead which i'm going to be bottling and part of it's going to be set up for ritual uh, uses and then the rest is going to be for enjoyment. So I want to thank all of you guys. I hope everybody had a good time and maybe learned just a little. We just barely scratched the surface, giving you some ideas. Hope you get a thumb up and some loves. I hope you guys are having a great night. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a drink here. 
And what I want to do is, before we close out, I just want to thank everybody. We're going to take a minute to kind of just bring the energy of the evening down, get everybody set into the rest of their, uh, you know, things that they're going to do. And I hope you guys can join me on Sunday for the ritual. And then uh, this next Thursday, we're going to be doing classes on Thursdays because it's easier to do. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to have Lesson 5, and we're going to get ready for that. So um, having said that, everybody that's viewing right now, uh, good God, we're almost at 1,100 and some change people viewing. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Um, I hope you guys have a great night. So what we're going to do is we're going to sit back, get a little bit relaxed, and we're going to close our eyes. And we're going to inhale and get some deep breaths in, and then we're going to chant the awe wind three times. Oh. May the blessings of body, mind, and spirit be yours. If you guys have any questions, feel free to put them down here on the side of the video. Um, if you have other things that you want to ask about, feel free to catch me here on Facebook, friend me, and get a hold of me, and I'll do my best to answer whatever questions you may have about uh, any of the videos that we put up. And I just like talking to people, druid or non-druid, just help, helping people. And like I say here in just a few, we're going to get off of here and I'm going to have this processed so probably within the next 45 minutes to an hour this will be ready and you will find this on YouTube on a pagan perspective uh, and it, I'll put it back up here in Missouri Druid School so that you can share this and you can use this as a reference and I hope everybody has a great week some places we're getting rain and and all these different things and it's getting cold in spots and like where my mom lives in Colorado they're looking at snow this week so be safe stay in as much as possible love your kids and each other and uh, blessings of the old gods to you all from the altar to the ring I will see you soon see you Sunday night for the ritual blessed ever be to everybody